Hi, I'm Mike. And I'm Heather. And this is Let's Talk Outdoors. Today we are chatting with Rick Driedicker. Rick is a canoe enthusiast who is an expert of the Churchill River. He is the owner and operator of Churchill River Canoe Outfitters, where paddlers from all around North America travel out of their way to tell stories around Rick's campfire. In this episode, we're talking paddling, relationships, and why craft dinner is not the ideal choice for your next long adventure. There we go. Hello. <laughs> hey, Rick. Hi. Rick, would you be willing to introduce yourself to our listeners a little bit? I am Rick Driedeger. I run Churchill River Canoe Outfitters in Mississippi. I have been running Churchill River Canoe Outfitters since uh, 1986. And uh, before that, I ran a business called Wilderness Trails. We took kids, usually youth groups, kid like high school age kids and university age kids on canoe trips. And I started that business in 76. And uh, my first canoe trip was in 72. And somehow I fell in love with the idea of taking people on canoe trips and sharing wilderness with people. And... Uh, I don't know, most people that go on a canoe trip, they think, well, that's great. Let's do this every year, you know, a trip every year. And I went a step further for some reason. And and, uh, and that's all I've done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of been a boring one track life, you know. But, uh, <laughs> no, boring is. Yeah, yeah I right doubt word. that. <laughs> but uh, I mean, in a very small nutshell, that's that's kind of what I've done for the last uh 50 well whatever it is i i, I have yeah, I 76 think, yeah yeah like since 70s i started the first person that i guided with was a guy named orville andres who who has he's he's he died a couple of years ago at the age of 90 and uh he asked me, he said that he's, he's got a couple of canoe trips and he needed somebody to help guide. And he heard that I'd been on a canoe trip. And so he wondered if I would be willing to come up to, I mean, in those days you didn't need to know much. I could keep a canoe going in a straight line and that was about it. Right. You learned and, on the job. Yeah. And then he made the mistake of asking me after the second trip, how much I wanted to get paid for this. And I had never conceived <laughs> that one could actually get paid to go on a canoe trip like that was, that was completely foreign to me and it blew my mind, you know, it completely changed my view of this industry that I thought that I, you know, that, that I was dabbling in. And, uh, uh, so that it became a career because Orville Andrews asked me how much I wanted to get paid. <laughs> now, how old were you at that time? 19. Oh, okay. Wow. So you had been on a canoe trip before that, or had you been yes, doing a bit of that no, when I, you were in your younger years? No, I'd been on a canoe trip. I'd done a lot of sort of wilderness camping in my parents' pasture, you know, and from the time I was eight or nine. But a canoe trip was a whole, was a whole different, like, I mean, I could set up a tent and build a, a fire and cook, but I, but a canoe trip was a whole other, a whole other level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you have any experiences when you were young that kind of indicated how you'd be spending the rest of your life? Or was it, was that kind of one of well, the biggest? Uh, no experiences that told me that this is what I was going to do up until grade 12, like from the time, like up until my last year of high school, my intent was to become a, a an astronomer. You know, I was going to get my PhD in physics and be an astronomer. And, uh, you know, and that's everything that I did up until grade 12 was towards that. And then in grade 12, I started to realize that I didn't really want to go to school for the rest of my life. <laughs> and that's really what I would be doing if, if I'd followed that career path. That's pretty great. Yeah, that's amazing to me. I think about going on a canoe trip with with a very competent and, <laughs> and exciting guy. But for you to be able to describe the stars on the canoe trip that you're guiding as well, that's, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> well, like, yeah, but <laughs> yeah you might be using your schooling more than you think out on right. the, <laughs> on the river <laughs> and mike and i were reading a little bit about you before and uh, and we saw that you and your wife actually met on a canoe trip that you were guiding yeah. uh, was she already a canoe enthusiast or did she you get a, her into she was it a wilderness enthusiast 
And she had been in a canoe a bunch of times, but not really on a trip before. We were offering a two-week canoe trip at that time that was a, that you could get credit for at a couple of different Bible colleges. Okay. And, uh, and I was one of, the, one of the two leaders on that. And uh, she came along. And, but what attracted me to her right at the start, like we were driving up and I noticed one of my tires was low on my car. And, and I went into the service station to get a tire tester and they didn't have one. And she said, oh, I have one in my purse. I thought, wow, here's a young lady that has a tire tester in her purse. Like, <laughs> this is like, yeah, anyway. She's a keeper. Yeah, she's a keeper. <laughs> <laughs> and I was reading some of her bounds. She can, like, carve canoes and things yeah, like she, that? She, built, uh, she, went, she, she went through university building canoes uh, and, get, and, and selling them. And uh, she would usually make three in the summer. And uh, she was selling them for... Well, so around 3,000, some more and some less. That's impressive. The wood, wood epoxy. Beautiful, so the, beautiful canoe. So just beautiful. Yeah. The young entrepreneur in your must have also thought this would be a good opportunity for your future business to marry someone well, that could you know, help out time, someone. At the time, we thought that she could just build the canoes for our business. But they're mm. just way too nice to rent out to people. Like, there's not a chance. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah, that's incredible. So I think I don't know if we jumped around a bit. So um, you went on a canoe trip with uh, Mr. Andries. I remember yeah. um, his name correctly. Yeah, yeah. And um, and he asked how much you wanted to get paid. And yeah. then is that when you started thinking like, hmm, I should start a business and you started guiding? Yeah. Well, and I then you really, met your wife? Or? Yeah, well, well, there's quite a few years in between there, but I didn't really think that I would start a business at the time. I like, I just thought that, well, okay, then I should really get paid for the canoe trips that I helped to guide. And I was, you know, I, I, Orville Andres and I did a number of trips together over, over the next three years. And, uh, and I started guiding with a fellow named Laverne Jance. He was the person who guided that first canoe, canoe trip I was on. And, uh, and him and I guided a bunch of trips together from, the early seventies through to, uh, well, the early eighties. And, uh, and I was also guiding canoe trips with a fellow named Paul much. And all of us got together and we said we should form a, a business like a company. And so that's how wilderness trails, like we, we were doing this anyway, and we might as well do it under the name of somebody and then and coordinate all of this. And we, it was like Wilderness Trails was started as a nonprofit corporation. And uh, I got really, really frustrated with that because when we were doing, you know, six or eight trips in the summer, it worked because we had sort of our business model was that we would work at getting donations that would cover about 30% of these, of these trips. And when there's eight trips, 30% isn't very much. But we qu quickly grew to doing between 30 and 40 trips. And then 30% is a heck of a lot of money. So even though we were doing 30 to 40 canoe trips, we were losing money hand over fist because we just weren't charging enough because, because of that business model. And the people with the most money wouldn't donate. Like they wouldn't, we'd go to a group and we'd, you know, we'd, you know, and they would be a bunch of rich, rich kids. And we would talk to their parents and we'd tell them like, you're paying for 70% of the trip with the fees, but we would really like it if you could cover the other 30% plus 30% for some people who don't have money. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you'd say that to people who didn't have money and they would cough up right. money, but people who did wouldn't. <laughs> and so in, in 79, I decided that I should start a profit organization that could run parallel to, to wilderness trails. So I started horizons unlimited in 79 and Horizons Unlimited ended up buying Churchill River Canoe Outfitters and Horizons Unlimited is still the parent company that runs Churchill River Canoe Outfitters. And uh, yeah. Yeah, very neat. So that in terms of business, that's kind of, and Wilderness Trails kind of, when I bought, when I bought Churchill River Canoe Outfitters in, in 86, then Wilderness Trails died. Mm. Natural death. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> At least we forget. 
It's uh, it must be a pretty cool moment though, when you realize that you do have a skill that is marketable and that you can turn into a business. I don't have any, but I would imagine for someone who does have skills like that, it's You're pretty good at asking questions. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it was really cool. Like when, when I started to realize that, you know, I had the, I had the, the physical skills, but it was more than that. Like I realized that I loved to share what I was finding, what I was seeing and what I was doing. Like it, like I, I just, well, what I noticed is after that first canoe trip in 72, uh, I, I didn't take pictures on that canoe trip. So I went to Laverne, the guy who was guiding the trip. And I said, do you have any slides? And we made a, we made a duplicate copy of his slides so that I could go around and tell all my friends about this canoe trip. Like I just really got, was passionate about sharing what I discovered and what I'd found. And it was just all this new stuff. Like, like I didn't know Saskatchewan had a North, you know, like I just thought it was mm. prairie up until forever. And then it turned to tundra, you know, like I didn't realize that we had what we, and I just got so excited about sharing that. And so in that sharing, I talked so many people into coming on a canoe trip with me the next summer that we had, a number of groups, you know, that it, it, and I think for me, that was the marketable skill that I noticed in myself, you know, not only could I paddle a canoe in a straight line and go down some rapids and do, you know, do all that kind of stuff. But, but the, the passion that I had for sharing the wilderness with people was really what, well, that's really what's made my business as successful as it mm. seems to be. Um, uh, we were reading, uh, some of your more satirical, satirical write-ups. Uh, one of them is called Rick's 20 reasons not to paddle the Churchill river. <laughs> and it's really yeah. interesting. We both enjoyed it. Yes. <laughs> okay. yeah. 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 Uh, we'll try and put the link into the notes of the episode too, but, um, do most canoeists have a good sense of humor? Or is that just unique to you? Oh, I think it's just like the general public. Like there's some of us who can laugh at stuff and some of us who just can't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, mean, I don't think it's unique to, to paddlers necessarily. Uh, I think paddlers have to be fairly good conversationalists. Cause I've, I've had a few bit different partners Yeah, and you know, you spend a long time with them or, you know, they go in days and you need someone either talking or you both yeah. need to be on the same page. of like, we're not much talkers. We're yeah, just going to yeah. enjoy. I, I have well, paddled with people who were dead quiet the whole time. And, uh, you know, the, either they're not thinking at all or they're so deep in their own thoughts that, that they can't speak. I kind of think it's the former. They're not thinking at all. But because uh, some people just are that way. They didn't really do it. Right. But, and uh, some people, that's the whole, what they're looking for. You know, I mean, exactly. Yeah, that's yeah. kind of a blessing when they're out there then. Hey, is yes, there exactly. is a chance to turn off their mind? And Yeah. 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 Uh, Rick, you've been canoeing now for uh, for 40 years. Um, and you're what those in the business would call, I guess, a vet of the waters. Um, you might even have a sea shanty written about you for all we know, but, uh, we know you have a few young canoeists in your outfit too, like yeah. Zev Hewer, and we yeah. introduced yeah. Zev actually as our first guest of the podcast. Yeah. Um, do you see some of yourself in the next generation of adventurers around oh, you? Yeah. Yeah. There's a, it's interesting because I see a piece of me in a lot of these different people and, uh, I think that like everybody else, I'm a unique individual. And so I don't see all of myself in anybody, but, but, uh, you know, Zev certainly, certainly that, that desire to just go, I, I remember being, well, I guess a little older than him, but his age, you know, and I started doing solo canoe trips and the, and the, the, and he's way more goal oriented than I ever was. And, uh, and he's, he's, he's an amazing, amazing kid, like just way beyond his years. And so I don't see myself in him in that way at all, <laughs> but, uh, but that, that drive that he has. And, and then uh, there's another fellow that uh, a fellow named Lane that works for me that, that has this just intense love of being out, like just that, uh, and he has this quiet way about him and there's aspects of him that I see in myself too. And, or that I aspects of myself that I see in him. 
as well. And like, I could, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Like there's, there are so many people in this younger generation that, that have amazing potential if they stick to it. I mean, most everybody, they stick to it for four or five or six years and then life's commitments come along and usually they meet a, a boy or a girl and that's it. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of potential in this next generation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. (laughs) Oh, no, that's okay. And you had said that Zev had a lot of drive. And I was just thinking for anyone to go up to Churchill River and canoe. And for you who does it often, I think that in itself requires a lot of drive. And uh, your number one reason for um, for not paddling the Churchill River was because it's not a river and it's just a series of lakes. And I can definitely (laughs) attest to that because my first trip up to the Churchill River, I I said, this isn't a canoe trip. This is a portaging trip because that's all you seem to do, right? You get past one lake and then you portage to the next. And if there's anything that requires drive, it's portaging. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, that that was one of the things that really blew my mind when I first started, you know, remember the third day, I think of that first canoe trip, Laverne gave my paddling partner, Vic and I, the map. And said, okay, here, you guide for the day. Like, he'd done a lot of teaching on how to read a map and compass and all that. And so we had the map. And I started looking at the land all around. And everywhere, it just started to feel like you could just walk over a hill and there'd be another lake. It didn't matter which direction you went. And that's kind of the way it is. And that's one of the really amazing things about our part of the world is that it is so interconnected that if you are willing to portage, you can go anywhere, absolutely anywhere in every little portage you do is like another adventure into a whole new part of the world that (laughs) maybe nobody's been there for a while you know and yeah there getting back to this thing about the churchill river being a series of lakes so maybe about six or eight maybe eight seven well and half a dozen or so years ago there was a there was a fellow that ended up at our place big brood it was like just a big strong guy drove up from Yellowstone with his wife and he was planning to paddle from Mississippi to Churchill, Manitoba. This is the Churchill River the whole way. And, and yeah. so he, when we went down to the dock, jumped to my dock and he looked around and he said, so how far do I have to paddle before I hit the current that'll take me out to Churchill? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you never looked at a map, did you? <laughs> <laughs> and and he found it, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. The name is deceiving, but there are, you know, it's a, it's a, it's such a cool place. Yeah. What a wake up call for that guy. Hey. Oh, I can tell lots of stories about what happened to him along the way, but that would take away from our. <laughs> Well, actually, we've had a few requests for you um, to be on our podcast. And most people say we want Rick on there for story's sake, like just for him to tell the stories that he's heard. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I'm in the middle of writing a a book now called Stories of the Churchill. And so. Oh, that would be fantastic. That is amazing. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Your company's website is a really cool resource and I've been checking it out all week, but. One thing in particular that grabbed my attention is that you say uh, your tours have famous gourmet foods. Uh, what type of foods are we talking about here? Are you guys like, boy, oh boy. You, maybe we shouldn't say that. Are you guys selling dehydrated foods as gourmet? Or? Well, we, we, we dehydrate our own food first off. And uh, a lot of times the food that we serve, people are surprised at because they don't expect it. They don't expect stuff. Right. Yeah. They expect a package of mountain house <laughs> yeah. food with some boiling water and then you try to eat it, you know, and, and uh, our food is considerably better than that. <laughs> there is something special about canoeing and like working hard and then setting up camp and then having a nice meal. That yeah. is. Yeah. There are a few things that beat that when you're out there. Years ago, we had this fellow named Greg that helped guide some trips and he's he's a gourmet chef and uh we'd pull into camp at five in the afternoon and he would get the whole 
you know, people would be busy setting up their stuff, but he'd get everybody involved in cooking this meal. And it would mm. take four or five hours. And it would be the most incredible food you have, you've ever had in your life. So we've kind of, we, I can't, like, no, none of us want to spend four or five hours cooking a meal when we're out in the wilderness. I mean, Greg did. And it was, it was worth it, every minute of it. But the rest <laughs> of it, we a bunch of the things that Greg would do. And we've tried to figure out how to shorten them so that we still get something of almost that quality. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that was, yeah, Greg. Was, that was kind of the experience. That's, that's yeah. really cool. I know that we, my wife and I would go over to his place. Him and his wife would invite us over to his place for a meal. And, uh, see, now I'm getting you, you're getting me sidetracked. But anyway, I have to go. <laughs> Please do. We go to his place for a meal, you know. And when you go to somebody's house for a meal, you kind of expect the meal to be somewhat ready when you arrive. I mean, that's usually what I expect. But you get to Greg's place. He says, come around five. And so we get there and there would be absolutely nothing, nothing ready, nothing done at all. And you think, oh, but he'd pour you a glass of wine and he'd say, okay, so here's what we're going to do. And we'd go out to his garden and start gathering food. And we'd like, we, you know, we'd do, go right from the beginning and we'd be eating by 11. But the whole time before <laughs> that, we've been eating and drinking wine because he's been making all the hors d'oeuvres. And we've been, you know, and, it, and you get home at one in the morning having had an amazing, amazing evening and an amazing meal. And you learned so much about how to prepare whatever it is that you were preparing. Very and cool. That was the way Greg was guiding a canoe trip as well. And uh, it was pretty cool. Wow. <laughs> wine and cheese, the key to getting people to cook with you. Yeah. So you said you had started out um, canoeing with kids, right? Mm -hmm. And running and running some canoe trips for kids. Do you do you ever get groups of kids coming out anymore? Yeah, like I know you have school groups, and do you go out with school groups or? Well, I don't. I have staff that do. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and uh, we've also started a, a youth program where. Uh, where we're taking high school age kids on three, on a three week wilderness experience that where they do everything from packing their packing the food for the trip, like planning the route together, packing, planning the menu together, packing the food, and then heading out for for like two and a half weeks, and then coming back oh, and doing the whole cleanup thing, and uh, and the whole trip is is focused around giving these kids a really, really good wilderness experience so that they are excited to go out again and mm. enough skill that they, well, they're too young to go out on their own maybe, but, but they can certainly help. Yeah. Like, like, you know, the, oh. yeah. I mean, so that we're, we're starting a program like that and uh, yeah. Well, very neat. And those experiences just stay with the kids for so long too, even yeah. after they, you know, even after they've, they've finished the trip and years later, it's, it's pretty neat. Yeah. So this program, you said you're just starting up. Is that, uh, is that something that any teenager anywhere could yep. say, Hey, I want to join this in the summer for three yep. weeks. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Very neat. Yeah. No, yeah. no, no, uh, pre skills required. Just need to want to spend three to weeks. get out there yeah. three weeks yeah. is you know that would be quite an experience i've never been on a canoe trip longer than a week so yeah three weeks would be something pretty special well it's pretty mm -hmm. pretty cool like like most kids i mean there's a lot of kids that go on a, a school trip for two nights yeah three days two nights kind of a thing and i you know i think it, i mean it's good they're doing that but to really experience wilderness like you just you don't really get you know, like, you know, the, the stages of group development, you know, how you go from forming, norming, storming, performing, and adjourning, like those five stages. And like forming, norming, storming are all the, those first three are all the things that start to form a group. And, you know, you go through those stages, sometimes very quickly and sometimes very slowly. But what you're always, what you as a guide or what me as a guide is always working towards is getting that group to the performing stage because then the group is cohesive. They're working together. They, they, without really even thinking, they know what to do. They, they, you know, it's just, and they're, they're, they're working together. They, they care about each other and all those kinds of things that make a group really, really work well. And, 
And when you're when you're only out for two or three or four days, you don't really quite get there. And I agree. You, even if you do mm-hmm. get there, you're already adjourning by the time you get there. And that throws the whole group into chaos again, because all you're thinking about is, you know, what, what's, what are you going to, which restaurant do you want to go to on your drive South kind of a thing, you know, like, mm-hmm. right. And, or what's like your a, first shower in a week going to feel like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And, mm-hmm. You know, what are you going to say to your mom and dad? But anyway, you know, like all these. Yeah. Uh, you don't get, you don't have that time just to get lost in it for a while. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so when it's a three week trip, you know, if you spend the first three, four or five days, forming that group in those first three stages of, of, of group development. And then you've got like two and a half weeks, two weeks, two and a half weeks to really perform and to get the group just working so well together and learning. Like it's, it's in that stage that you really start learning about, you know, not only just about your wilderness skills, but learning about how to, how to interact with people and how to be a, how to be a group, like how to work together and all that. And, and so that three weeks, I think is a, is a perfect, perfect amount of time. Yeah, longer, that, that could be life changing. Be yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Uh huh. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. And and what a leap of faith, I'm sure, for some for some teenagers who will take that on, right? And think, yeah. you know, I'm going to sign up for this alone. I'm not going to bring my best friend, but they'll probably make a, a new best they'll friend a whole out there. Bunch of new best friends. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. They just don't believe it when adults say it to them. No, but at the end, right. kids just oh. got to go and do it themselves. Yeah. <laughs> it's like that cheesy adult thing to say, you'll make yeah. a new best they, friend. They, you really will. They, they were never a kid like Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we had this discussion or something like it with Zev actually when we were chatting with him because he said that it took him about three days to um to really feel comfortable alone and then he got into his groove on his trip from Canmore to Mississippi. Yeah. And and we said that that three days is is basically the the magic ticket for things to start happening. And yeah. Mike Mike is also a a teacher and yeah. and he said that he's taken his kids out and Mike have you gone for longer than three days or it's still No, I got to adjust this now. in my in my course because it's a three day canoe trip. And like just but they like the kids know it's three days too. And that's another thing. Maybe if I was like surprising them with like you don't know when you're getting out of the river, but they always know. And so I've never re- like it's always been a fun experience. Oh, the yeah. kids always really enjoy it. Yeah. But I've never gotten to well, like to those stages. I've never gotten to like see them working as a cohesive unit. You know, it's kind of like each of them are alone surviving or like with a friend surviving for three days and like, you know, yeah. trying to find the ways to make this this um environment seem like home as opposed to making the environment your new home kind of thing. Mm, interesting. Yeah, that's good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I've got to change what I'm doing. Or just bring well, it to you. It's hard to do that within the school system, you know, like you know, I mean, you yeah. don't have that much time. Rick, you've recently written a book uh, describing in detail 80 of the various routes one can paddle in northern Saskatchewan. Um, that's a lot of routes to explain. How long uh, did it take you to venture down all of those different paths? Well, I haven't done all of them. And I say that in the introduction of the book, that I haven't done all of them, but I've talked to people that have done all of them. I mean, I've talked to people. Mm. Yeah. There's so many people come through my office and I, and and they and uh, every summer and I I'll, I if I have time I always get them to tell me about the canoe trip that they were on and uh, so I've probably done three quarters of those routes mm. and uh, <laughs> that's still an amazing yeah number. that is a lot the other, the other quarter I've talked to many groups that have done them and. Uh, and so that information comes secondhand then. Yeah. That's great. Do you have a favorite trail up there that you like to go? I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> 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 I find that, that, that uh, how much I enjoy the canoe trip has less to do with the route that I'm on and more to do with the people I'm doing it with. And, and, uh, if you ask what some of my favorite trips were, that has nothing to do with the route. Uh, cause I've been on some amazing, amazing routes with a group that wasn't much fun. And that route has a bad taste in my mouth, you know, and I've been on some horrible, horrible routes 
that I would never, never bring a group on again. And they're some of my favorite trips, you know? And, and so, uh, and I, and that route, I was conjures up this beautiful feeling in me because of the group that I was with, even though the route, like I go, oh, I'm not taking something. I'm never doing that one again, but, uh, <laughs> you know, so, so it's difficult. It's a difficult question to answer. I remember one, one trip where we, uh, we decided we'd start at Little Deer Lake. And if you look at a map, Little Deer Lake doesn't have any place to go out. Like there's no, there's no exit to Little Deer Lake. So we made a two and a half, well, about a two kilometer portage, just cross country. And it ended up being in a lot of musking. And uh, it took us just about a day to get everything across that portage. And we had so much fun. Like we just, we were laughing. Like it was, it was the group. You know, like mm. it's a group, and I would never do that again. But <laughs> yet, when I think about paddling from Little Deer Lake, like we went from Little Deer Lake to Contact Lake, and and uh, when I think about doing that, like that conjures up just some of the best feelings because of the group. And uh, and yet, no, 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 you know, there isn't a route there at all. And if you look in my book, there's I don't describe that route at all. Like there isn't one. <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> And on that trip too, like we, I we were, I don't know what was, I, I planned that road. Why did I do this? But we also were looking for a way to go for another, like, inst- like, you know, you're going upstream on the Churchill, like you get into like, well, we did the road from contact Lake North into, into McKay Lake and then North from there into the Churchill. And there's a lot of long portages in there. And we got to the Churchill on the Pew Lake and, and, and we were going to want to, we wanted to go upstream, but instead of going up the channel. If you go, there's that bay called Bernaski Bay, Bernaki Bay or Bernaski. I can't remember going, coming from the north. And if you go into that bay and then veer off to the, to the uh, west, there's a bunch of little lakes and then you can go through a p- couple of portages and, and then you're into, uh, none of, if you don't know the maps, this doesn't mean anything, but <laughs> there are other ways to go places. And we found all these other ways to get places rather than just following the Churchill river. Mm. And so every place we went, there weren't portages and we were crashing through the bush and in Muskeg up to our, well, I always say if there wasn't for permafrost, we'd probably still be there, you know, <laughs> permafrost. And then, and that's one of my favorite trips all time. That's one of my favorite trips, but the route is one I've never done again. But in terms of special places, like if you just, there's a, there's a, a beautiful spot. Like one of my Solly Moss Lake uh, is in the McLennan Lake area. It's sort of going south from the McLennan Lake area. And there's this gorgeous lake. And if you paddle into it, there's three portages going into the lake from the north and one going out from the lake. Well, there's two. Uh, you paddle into the lake from, um, there's a portage from Settee Lake. And it takes you into the lake and there's just high rock all around. All around is just high rock. And when the first time I paddled in there, it was late at night. We were looking for a place to camp and it was starting to get dark. So we each paddled opposite shores and we could just talk like we're talking now and it would echo back and forth. Boom, boom. It was one of those quiet, quiet nights. It was just gorgeous. We finally found this place to camp and it was, you know, it was dark. We couldn't tell if it was nice or not. When the morning we got up, we looked around and it was just the most gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous spot across the, we were on this rock point looking out over the lake and across the lake was just high rock all over the place. And we we yell it out, echo, boom, 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 all over the place. And one of the guys on the trip, Vic, was an was a avid fisherman. And he cast three times and had two big lake trout. And uh, <laughs> the boons were calling like it was just magic. And uh, so after the trip, I was thinking, well, was it really that nice? Or was it just circumstances? And I've camped there numerous times since then. I've sent lots of people there. I say, like, if you're paddling through, like do this little side trip through Solly Moss and camp at that spot. And everybody comes back and tells me that it's one of their favorite, favorite places to camp. So I mean, that, that's, I mean, I could name all kinds of other places, but that's one of my, it's the people. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, actually that might make me want to cut this part out of the podcast so I can go alone and not have a whole bunch of people yeah. there when I go yeah. this summer. <laughs> that sounds incredible. Yeah. So you've probably had some folks from all around North America come up to Miss Nippy. Uh, is there any one of your favorite stories to share that you've heard about a water adventure? 
Oh, uh, <laughs> one story. Oh, well, you, you can pick a few because I think <laughs> yeah. you're probably sifting through yeah, thousands like, right now. Like, uh, uh, there's, oh, man. Oh, that's, that's a hard one. That's, that's, uh, <laughs> um, the first thing that I thought of was that we have all these people that stop in at our place that are paddling across Canada. And for some reason, people, it, it, like there's the word has gotten out that if they're paddling across Canada, they need to stop in at Churchill with canoe outfitters. And what we started, what we started to do, like probably 20 years ago or 25 years ago, is when people are paddling across Canada and they stop in, we give them a, a free night in the cabin and we bring them over to our house and we have this big meal of steak and all that kind of stuff because they're probably craving meat and they're probably craving vegetables. So we have mountains of salad and, and we get them to tell stories. And we've had some just the most amazing, amazing stories of people coming through. And when you said, what are you like, tell us a story kind of a thing. I don't remember exactly how you, the first thing I thought of was these people that stop in and the stories that they tell, because there's, there's, we had a guy stop in one time. He's paddling solo. He, this was, this was in the late nineties and he wanted to be the first person to paddle across Canada solo in one season. And he started in, Montreal and he was hoping to get to the west coast before things before the season was over and uh, he was so uptight like he got out of his canoe and every muscle in his body was clenched and his teeth are you know he couldn't talk with his mouth open because his jaw was clenched and I thought oh man but he asked if he could stay the night someplace and so I gave him a cabin and, and we had him over for supper and we tried to get him to tell stories and he, he, it was difficult to get much out of him, but eventually he talked about that he'd started in Montreal and he just got so uptight because he was having to paddle up the Ottawa River. Well, he should have known that. And the water was really high in the spring runoff. And he ended up in in the hospital in the mental ward or whatever that's called in Ottawa because he was just driving him nuts because he couldn't, he wasn't getting very far very fast. But uh, they let him out after a while and he continued on his journey. And when he got to our place, like again, he was just like every muscle in his body is up. <laughs> oh, this poor guy. Uh, one of the things I always do is ask, often do is ask people what they're eating. Because I often think, you know, when you're doing something like you're doing a marathon every day, like your food is just so important. He cooked two craft dinners for breakfast, had the leftovers for lunch and three for supper. Oh boy. I wonder yeah. how much of his mental state <laughs> has to do with the food he was eating. Right. Great plug for craft dinner. Great yeah. plug. <laughs> so, <laughs> the noodles of champions. Yeah, yeah. The day after he left, this guy, somebody came into my office, this really amazingly handsome young man. At least that's what all the girls told me. <laughs> and he plunked himself down in the chair in my office, the big soft chair, and he just, you know. Just totally relaxed, totally laid back. I said, so, like, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm paddling from New York to Nome. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, there was a book written in, in the 20s, New York to Nome, and it's about these two guys that paddled from New York to Nome. And he read that book, and he said, I got to do this. I just got to do this. He'd never canoed before, so he made his own canoe. It was really kind of a cool craft. He made all of his own gear, his own paddle, his own everything. And he set out paddling from New York to Nome. And he had story after story after story about his adventures. And it always showed that he'd been experienced, but somehow he was able to just like, and he was so laid back and so easygoing. I said, well, have you met this other guy? Because you've been paddling the same route a lot of the way. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah. We, he passes me every morning and I pass him every evening, you know, kind of a thing. Like, because this guy would the guy that came in earlier would be got would was up at four every morning and would paddle till supper time you know six or so well the guy this laid back guy that stopped in he would get up at noon and have a leisurely breakfast and he'd get paddling by three in the afternoon and usually paddle till two or three in the morning wow because <laughs> he said it's calmer in the evening and at night so why not paddle then mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know he talked about he's paddling along lake superior in the dark and he hit and he canoe rode up on this rock and he thought, oh, well, this is a good place to stay the night. Like he couldn't, like it was dark. He couldn't see that there was a rock there. And he said, the rock was just big enough for me to put my sleeping bag down. So I, I tied the canoe to my, to my arm 
and, uh, <laughs> and I went to sleep. And he woke up with the waves washing over the rock. And, and uh, he said, like, waves were way too big for me to paddle. So I tied myself to the rock. <laughs> and I sat there all day with the waves washing over me. And then when it calmed oh, down in the evening, I, I took off again. What? <laughs> and he just had story <laughs> after story. Like, just so he hung around for a week and we just had an amazing time. Like he played with my kids. They were just little, like two, two and four year olds then. And he played with my kids and they just loved him. And uh, the staff thought he was just the greatest guy around. And uh, I phoned the newspaper in LaRange and I said, you got to come and interview this guy. But that was before the newspaper shut down. And they sent one of their young female reporters out and she fell in love with him and she wanted to leave her husband and just take off with him and go on this. <laughs> she asked him the question. I sort of was sitting in the, periphery listening she asked him the question like what what would motivate you to do something like this like this is something really big like you like like I mean you not anybody would just drop everything and he said well haven't you ever just had a dream that you wanted to do something and you thought well this is nuts and so you didn't do it well you're missing out so much on life like you just when you have this dream that you want to do something you just got to do it grab it and go for it because that's that's where that's where life is that's so I've kept, I kept in correspondence with this guy and uh, he made it to Yellowknife. His plan was to get to Yellowknife in one season and then get a job over winter in Yellowknife and then continue on to Nome the next, the next year. And uh, so I got a letter from him from, uh, from uh, uh, Fort McMurray. He said he'd given all of his coffee to this the hop tight guy. So I sent him a, pound, a bunch of coffee to meet him in uh, Fort Chip. And we got to Fort Chip, he got my coffee and he sent me another letter. And so I made it thanks for the coffee. And then, uh, and then I got a letter from him in uh, Yellowknife. I made it and I got a job. Uh, and then I got a letter from him towards spring saying, I met this girl and we moved to Florida. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Oh, so when you have a dream, you should follow it. <laughs> you had a new dream. Yeah. You never know where it's going to take you. Yeah. yeah. There are so many stories about people paddling across Canada because they're all really interesting, unique, amazing people. And uh, that other fellow did make it to the West Coast. He ended up in the mental hospital again in, in, uh, in, in Prince George. Uh, but, uh, when they let him out, he snowshoed and, and, uh, and walked the rest of the way wow. and he made it to the West wow. before Christmas. So, so he did make it, but, uh, that's, that's a long way to go on craft dinner. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. You were yeah. saying earlier that you had this kind of, well, you had this, this realization when you were younger that you could maybe make a business out of canoeing. Um, but what made you realize that you had uh i guess experience to to write a book oh uh this book has kind of been in the works for 20 years uh maybe more but i have dreamt of making this book for like for at least that long uh and i'd always get thwarted because somebody else would write a book and i would realize that i didn't want to write a book like that one you know, like not that their books weren't good, but they had a shelf life because they went into way too much detail. And, and I was trying to think of how do I like, you know, like there's all these details that about canoe trips that people need to know before they head out. And, but those details continue to change. And if you write them down in a book, a book is a permanent thing. Like in the one book that it says uh, the portage is right next to the dock. A doc hasn't been there since hmm. the book was written. Hmm. Uh, and we've had a number of people come into the office and say, it says the portage is right by the dock. And we went there and there's no, we couldn't <laughs> find a dock anywhere on that lake. And we couldn't find, well, if you just looked at the map, sir, but anyway, you know, it's it, <laughs> you know, that, that kind of a thing, you know, a forest fire goes through, a windstorm goes through, a, a campsite gets wrecked because of whatever. And, and like the details change, the experience of the trip doesn't change. And so I wanted to write, a. I ended up deciding that I, what I wanted to do is write a book about the experience of going on the Foster River or the experience of, 
of paddling the Foster Lakes or the experience of being on the Hawk Rock River or the experience, like, what is it like? Like, what do you feel when you're on those rivers? Like, what, what is, what is the terrain like? What's special about, about that particular route? Because that isn't going to change. And 20 years from now, this book should still be a good book. Uh, mm -hmm. Because the experience of doing that trip didn't change. And if people want the details, my son makes these maps that have all the details on the map and we maps and we update them constantly. Some of the, some of them we update two or three times a summer and other ones, because they're less traveled, it, we only update them a couple of times in, in like maybe two, twice in five years or something, but we have all those details. And if somebody wants, somebody can read my book and say, well, these three trips, I really, really want to do those other 77. I'm not interested in right now, but these three, I really want to do. They can come to us and they can get that detailed information. And, and so, Very cool. mm -hmm. and so, yes, I've been dreaming about doing this book for a long time. And uh, a number of, uh, maybe four or five years ago, my daughter, Sarah was starting to work in the office and she came, she said, Rick, like, you know, all this stuff. Or she didn't say Rick, she said, dad, you know, all this <laughs> stuff about these, can't you just write it down so that, because when people come in and they want to do a canoe trip, I don't know what to tell them the the geeky river is like, like, I don't know what to say. Like they ask, what's the geeky river? Like, well, I don't know. And they, they ask, well, what's it like paddling on the Johnson river? Well, I don't know, but you know, that stuff, dad, so you should write it down. So I started writing it down and I got maybe four trips in and then the summer was over and I kind of forgot about it. And then two summers ago, one of my new young staff, Aaron asked me the same thing. She said, you know, all this stuff, Rick, and we have to, we have to be able to tell people when they come into the office. And I thought, okay. So two summers ago, I decided it's time. And I will just write about the experience of these trips, put a map in, put, put a picture in for each one. And that was my, and, and so it only took, I started writing the trip, the book in September and I was done writing at the end of October, like writing the 80 routes was really quick and easy. And then it wow. took months and months and months and months to get those maps together and to, to, to where I liked them. And I, there's many, many versions of those maps that didn't make the cut. But that's what took the time. The writing of the book did not take very much time at all. <laughs> <laughs> that's, so that's incredible. That's part of the story of that book. Yeah. Well, I'm so happy that those that those people pushed you to it. And I can't wait to get my hands on it and take a look. Rick, what, which one piece of advice would you give to someone who's uh, just getting started with canoeing? And I'm sure you've probably even answered this question to people who come into your, into your store. Well, just go canoeing. <laughs> just go, just go, uh, I, you know, learn how to do it as you're doing it. Like, like be safe, like, I mean, learn the safety skills, learn that kind of stuff. Like there's lots of people that teach that kind of thing. Go with people that have more experience than you and learn from them, but just go canoeing. Like, like don't like uh, people think they need to take all these courses and be so, but I think just go find the right people and just go. And, uh, you'll learn as you go, you'll learn, you learn from each other and you learn from people with more experience than you. But if you sit and wait until the right time, well, there's never a per you just go. Yeah. I get, I don't know, 20 or more people applying to be guides for me every summer. I only need like a few. So most of them don't get to, don't get to guide. And one of the things that I look at, this isn't quite, this is a little different answer. I mean, this is answering a little different question than what you're asking. But, but I think it, they, 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 they go together. When I look through people's resumes, people that I want to hire, I shouldn't say this out, out loud because then people will just pad their resumes. But what I look for is, is uh, okay, a sign that I'm looking for if I'm not going to hire them is a sign that they want to work for me because they want to go canoeing. If they talk a lot about wanting to take people canoeing, that's a different thing than wanting to go canoeing. If they want to take people canoeing, and I look at what kind of work that they did. If all of their work has to do with being in wilderness, then I'm a little suspect. If they have a whole bunch of work that involves working with people, then I'm interested. 
because guiding a canoe trip is all about the people. Skills are easy. I can teach the skills to, I mean, you learn them by going canoeing, like, you know, that's easy. But the people skills, working with people and learning and, and being able to connect with the group of people and being able to help a group of people become more than they are, help each individual become more than they are. That's, that's what makes a good guide. And uh, so if people want to go canoeing, then they should just go canoeing. They shouldn't be a guide. You should be a university professor somewhere too. Teach it, you teach in your own way, which is pretty great. I, I have taught quite a, like I taught in like Lakeland College in Vermilion used to have a wilderness program. And I taught in that program for quite a number of years. Mm. I taught leadership and guiding. Um, so we're, we're kind of nearing the end of our, of our time together here, Rick. But one question we like to ask everyone is, um, where's your favorite place to visit in Saskatchewan? Well, that's kind of like your favorite route or your favorite. It's kind of like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Kind of like so that. you may have already answered. You may have already answered that. Well, that I don't have to go into answer. I used to, I would have said, you know, maybe 10 years ago, I would have said my favorite place to visit was to go home and hang out with my parents. And because I, as I got older, I found out my dad was really, really smart. And they both died in the last couple of years. So I can't go there anymore. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a place we, about 12 years ago or something, we bought, uh, we bought a place called Forest House and it's in the McLennan Lake area. It takes about four or five hours to paddle into there with five, four portages, I think. One, two, three, yeah. And, uh, that place is incredibly special to me. Like it just, it, there's something about being there that that uh, that feeds me, and I don't know. Like if you, I I'm kind of, I really enjoy Celtic spirituality, and they have this thing about thin spaces, you know, like places where 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 uh, the spiritual world and, and our world are really close together, you know. And when I go there, I feel that, like I feel that that. Uh, God or the spirit or whatever you want to, the mother nature, whatever you want to call, whatever you want to call that realm is right there. Like, it's just like, you don't have to reach very far to, to feel it. (laughs) And, uh, that area, I mean, it was absolutely, it's absolutely beautiful. We're on this little lake that, that, well, it's just this tiny little lake. My son used to, we'd go up there and he'd, every day he'd swim around the lake, you know, like it's not very big. And, uh, it's always dead calm. You know, the islands are always reflected upside down in the water, just perfectly and all that kind of thing. In 2015, a forest fire went through there and we were pretty sure that our place had burnt. Um, we were there the morning of, uh, and, uh, and we could see the fire coming and we thought we, we, we just have to get out of here. And, and we got out of there and, and our neighbor phoned us and said that he didn't think there was any way our place could, could have survived because that fire was, well, he, he was standing on his dock and the fire was about a half a kilometer away. And it was so loud that his dock was vibrating. Mm-hmm. Like the fire was, he said it was just like a freight train, like just like standing next to a freight train. That's how loud that fire was. It was just roaring and it was moving so fast heading straight towards our place and said, there's just no way your place could have survived. And a week later, when things had calmed down enough, we went out there, my son and I went out there and, and Dan and I both assumed that we'd be just, it'd just be ashes. Well, the fire burned right around our place. Mm. <laughs> like the, the, like our, on one side of our property, we have a bunch of Saskatoon bushes and they're scorched, but that's as close as the fire came on that side. The fire fr- had jumped across the lake and had burnt the shoreline in front of our lodge. Like you could, you could <laughs> stand on our deck and pee on the fire, kind of a thing. <laughs> and like it was that close. The windows on our lodge, the the the, uh, the caulking melted out of the windows. Wow! That close and that hot, and all around it was like that. But our place didn't burn. And when Dan and I walked in there, it was like that barrier in the Celtic thought you know that barrier between 
heaven and earth, if you will, was gone. Like it was like, this is it. Like I'm, I'm in this spiritual realm right here because this place was for whatever reason, this place didn't burn, you know, mm-hmm. and, and uh, it's just, it's just an amazingly special place. And if I could live anywhere in the world, it would be there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that is one of my favorite places in the world. Yeah. Favorite mm-hmm. place in Saskatchewan. And you let people rent this place out, right? I remember reading that and you can tell, and it's funny because I was reading this actually when I was quite tired earlier today and reading the description, I was just smiling the whole time. Cause I'm just like, whoever wrote this obviously cares. Like, I don't know. It just was so yeah, cool. Was, the place yeah, is kind yeah. of like the picture just came to my mind. It was really neat. I just enjoyed reading about it. I was saying to Heather right before the interview, I think I need to go here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm going next week. If you want to come. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rick, our very final question, and I, I tried to prep you in the email for it because it's it's a hard one. Uh-huh. But if you could change one thing about the world, what would it be? Yeah, well, that one I thought about for a while <laughs> because that that is a really interesting question. It's an interesting question. Yeah. Anyway, I came up with a word and I call it I, harmony. Like our world is so disjointed, like, like more, it seems more so than ever, like harmony between people. I mean, in, well, in Canada and to a way greater extent in the, in the U S we've got this huge division between left and right. And in just about every place, every aspect of life that you look there, there's like, like it, it Yeah. Harmony, harmony between us and, and, and the natural world, harmony between us and, and our neighbors, harmony between religions, harmony between uh, the, between colors. And, uh, you know, it just like, man, you know, if we could learn to live in harmony, not that we agree with each other. That's that's not harmony. That's 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 uh, that's that's a click. You know, and community is harmony. Community is where you've got a whole bunch of people that don't agree but yet get along because they like each other they love each other and so that that harmony man if i could change anything in the world it would be it would be that (laughs) that we could learn to live in harmony with with each other and with the natural world well said i think then everyone needs to go on a three-week canoe trip with you (laughs) (laughs) well Trying to work and trying to work my way out of my administrative role. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Rick, for for your time. Um, I knew that you uh, you wouldn't disappoint by any means, especially with uh, with what I've heard about you, what I've heard about Churchill River Canoe Outfitters, and and just uh, knowing the experience and the expertise that you were that you were bringing to the table here. I've really enjoyed our conversation tonight. Yeah, me too. It has been a lot of fun. I knew it would be. Yeah. Not at all. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so yeah. much, Rick. Yes, yeah, thank you. We'll do this again sometime. Mm-hmm. That'd be That'd lovely. Be great. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe, leave us a review on whatever app you're listening on and send it to a friend who you think might be interested.